not ready to give up. He just gets tongue-tied when he gets up here. So he said, first thing I'm going to say <laughs> is I'm going to make this bridge big enough that I can see it. <laughs> but I want to pray over my brother, okay? Oh, and I God. thank him for his willingness to serve. Father, thank you so much that you love us, that you love us in spite of our weaknesses, that you love us so much that you would send Jesus to die for us. And Father, I thank you for the spirit and heart of Merle. He's a good friend, Lord, and he's a good servant. Bless him as he reads your word. Give him strength. Let him know that all of God's children love him. No matter what, they love him and support him. Because guess what? We're just sinners saved by grace, every last one of us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, folks. Oh, I'm still going to put my glasses on. <clears throat> Well, today's scripture, God's word, is Matthew 1, 21 through 23. <clears throat> she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So be it. Children's Church. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and honor to serve you, for the opportunity to come here and sing praises to your name and study your word together as a body of Christ. Lord, we thank you that Jesus came, that he came as a man so that he could experience the things that we experience, and that he came as God so that he could cover our sins with his righteousness. Lord, we thank you for being called sons and daughters through that precious sacrifice that happened so many years ago. As we celebrate Christmas, help us to not forget what you have done for us and what the Lamb has done for us. We just ask these blessings upon your people, Lord, and Father, that we will be the kind of servants and the light to this world that we need to be to bring glory and honor to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's message is titled, Jesus, Our Emmanuel. What is it about a name? What does a name mean? Tells us who someone is, right? Our names tell us a lot about us, maybe where we come from, the character traits that we have. Jacob, for example, told you I was going to use you as a prop. He's like, is a Henson. He looks like a Henson, doesn't he? If you would see my dad, you'd say, yes, we all look like Hensons. If you'd see my dad's brother, you would say the same thing. We have a look that is characteristic to Hensons. Because I am a Henson, and Jacob is a Henson. My father was a Henson, and so forth. It's been going on for a pretty good long time. If you look at some of the ancestry uh, websites that are online, you'll see that that name dates back to at least the 1300s. It's Anglo-Saxon European origin. You'll find some Irish descent in there also. It literally means son of Hind, H-I-N-D-E, which was an occupational name meaning keeper of the deer. When I lived in Georgia, I might have been called hunter of the deer, but since I've been out in Idaho, I'm not called much of anything about deer. I see them on the road every once in a while, and they might hit my car. But other than that, that's about as much as I'm associated with deer. But if you look at some of those websites, I looked at one in particular, and it gave a concentration of where Henson's are found in the United States. And the biggest majority was found in one state, North Carolina. I was born in North Carolina. Imagine that. It said there were 190 to 378 Henson families found in North Carolina. Everywhere you go in the area, you see the name of Henson. You see names like Henson's Grocery, Henson's Barbecue, Henson's Deli. Thus, look at these two Hensons. Okay? We like food, right? Yeah. Although my wife's maiden name is Crunkleton, they must not like food very much she doesn't have an ounce of fat on her. German, okay. 
If you know anything about North Carolina, you also have heard of a little thing called NASCAR, because people are into driving cars fast there. You'll see more businesses like Henson's Racing, Henson's Garage, and of course if you race cars, Henson's Body Shop. You'll see them scattered all over the area, and I'm being literal. When you drive where I, in the area that I came from, you see Henson businesses all over the place. So it is true what that website says, that Henson's are located in North Carolina. If you continue to look at that website, you'll see that there are 64 to 189 Henson families spread out through the southeast. Then if you look out even further, there's only 1 to 63 families spread out over the whole United States, with none found in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and there's one plus in Idaho. That's us. <laughs> okay? So a little bit about Henson's. But here's a problem. When you get your information, where are you getting your information from? Sometimes that information is limited. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes it's biased. So when you're looking for in information about God and Jesus, here's where you turn, no matter what. It's fine to listen to other things, to study other things, but turn here to God's Word and seek Him. And this book promises you, this Bible promises you, that you will find God if you seek Him. God wants to be known. He wants to have a relationship with each and every one of you. That's why we're going to celebrate Christmas. God came to be with us. That's unusual. That's nons nonsensical. That God would choose to be with us. Every other religion says how you can obtain salvation. How you can reach God. But our God said, I will come to you. You cannot come to me. There are none righteous, no, not one. The problem with the information from this website that I was looking at is the census was taken in 1920. That's almost a hundred years ago. So Henson's could be all over the place by now. I might not be the only Henson family in Idaho. I like to think that I am though. Who knows? I spelled the H-I-N version. But there are other versions and it goes into that also. Like Jacob's middle name is Worthington. Still using you for example. He's like, why'd you tell everybody that? It's a big name. It comes from Worth. And there are many of different variations like that, like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It's also a last name telling a region. But the middle name, it's telling that he's by the river, I think is what it is, but I'm not positive. Jacob's first name, though, means that he's a deceiver, doesn't it? I lie awake at night sometimes saying, God, did you name him that or did I name him that? Why, oh Lord, why? Because sometimes he's lived up to his name. Don't we do that? But then I also hear in songs, and I read in God's Word, Jacob. God is the God of Jacob. And I think, wow. I don't hear that name about Alan. But I hear it about Jacob. Because that is my son's God. He worships that God, the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, that wants to be our Heavenly Father, not just our Creator, that wants to be our Lord, and that is Jacob's God. Then I don't think about the deceiver part or anything else, does it? Because Jesus Christ covered all of our sins. We don't have to look at ourselves in a negative way because we were made righteous through the blood of the Lamb. In the Bible, most times you do not see last names. But they weren't really used. You see things tied with names to further associate them, especially if you're a commoner. You see maybe that the person is referred to by their job, like Simon the Tanner. Or you see whose son they were, Simon the son of Jonah or John. You might see it as a surname that identifies them, like Simon the Zealot or even Simon Peter. If you're a common man, then you didn't have much heritage, did you? You were just common. And you know, Jesus, the name Jesus was the most common name of that time period. Jesus came in an insignificant way, a baby born in a manger, in obscurity. That wasn't who the Jews were looking for. But He came to teach us to be a humble servant. He gave up His throne in heaven, His deity, to come down and be a man but yet be God, so that He could experience everything that we could experience, and then to sacrifice His life for us. 
Think about all the things that Christmas stands for. Don't get sidetracked by all the family and friends and food and decorations. And remember to tell others why you believe. That this is the season of Jesus. He is the reason for the season. If you were royalty though, it was the opposite case. You had a last name or at least a position associated with it. Like Herod Antipas or Caesar Augustus or even Pontius Pilate. These were recognized, important men. So that puts a dilemma, doesn't it? Jesus, he didn't have a name associated with it. Oh, he had many names associated with it. He was Jesus Christ. He was our Emmanuel. He was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Jesus, the name above all other names. But yet he does present a problem for many, doesn't he? Why would God love us so much that He would come to us and be born a baby? To have to wear a diaper. To have to have someone feed Him and protect Him and take care of Him. Because He loved us so much. And why would someone give up their position of authority and power who was there in the beginning who created all things because of God's faithfulness and God's love? One of the names associated with Jesus was Jesus of Nazareth. Remember that one? We find it in John chapter 1. Verse 35 through 46 reads this. The next day John, and we don't have a last name there, so we have to read back and see that that was John the Baptist. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. There's the name of Jesus. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, another word, or another title, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, so we see that association tied with the name, who he was, he was Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that heard John. This is John the Baptist again. Had said who, who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote. So we've seen all kind of name associations there. Brother of, from here, Cephas, renamed. And then we see this, Jesus of Nazareth. And we see the son of Joseph. Now I don't know if it was intentional by Nathanael or not, but what he was saying was this, Jesus from Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? How can this be the promised Messiah when it comes from a town like Nazareth? That's what he was saying. Verse 46 says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. There's something very important about names. And the name here, Jesus of Nazareth, was not a compliment. Not in the context it was used. But now we can see that something beautiful came from Nazareth, didn't it? Just as we were foretold, just as we were promised by God, when He promised it to Abraham, when He promised it to David, which we saw in His covenants. Jesus was not only sent from God, but He was God's one and only Son. His lineage can be traced way back. And we'll read that lineage in just a second. But bear with me, because one of the weaknesses I have, one of the things that does bother me, is I struggle with the pronunciation, see I just did there, of a lot of these names and stuff. And I don't want to seem ignorant, but I want to proclaim God's Word whether I say it right or not. So you'll bear with me on some of these names. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah the son of David. Remember we talked about that last week. 
just as God promised. Here we're seeing re reality fulfilled. The son of Abraham, and this is where this lineage is going to start. Verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now we're going to skip down to verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Now we've seen the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant covered here. That God did exactly what He promised. That God is faithful and true. So that means that whosoever believes upon the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved, that you can believe it. It is a fact because it's God's Word. When Jesus said that I am going to prepare a place for you, it is a fact that He's preparing a place for us. Isn't that incredible? That we don't have to doubt. The joy that we have surpasses all understanding because God is faithful and loving. David was the father of Solomon whose mother had been, been Uriah's wife. We read about that. That even out of a sinful arrangement, that God still kept His promise that, promise. that God's ways are still true. Whenever we think there's victory, well, when there's defeat, there's victory in God. Peter thought that. He wanted to rescue Jesus in the garden. He wanted to cut off the... Well, he didn't want to cut off the ear. He wanted to cut off the head of the soldier that came. But he wasn't very good with a sword, was he? He should have stuck to fishing rods or nets because he only cut off the guy's ear. I don't know about you, but cutting off a Roman soldier's ear meant I'm fixing to get my behind kicked, right? So he should have stuck to fishing. But he wanted to protect Jesus, even though it was God's plan. He didn't understand that, that Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. And the time was approaching. So many times when we think that we're defeated, God's just using it for His glory. So think about that when the trials and tribulations are in your life. And think about how you can use this to glorify God. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Now I'm going to skip down to verse 12. After the exile to Babylon, and God is still in control here, isn't He? There's one of those situations. The Jews are in exile, but God is still going to keep His promise. When everything looked like despair and like there was no hope, God was still in control. He still keeps His promises. He still loves. Verse 12, uh, uh, verse 12 said, After the exile in Babylon, Jacona was the father of Shealtiel. Now see, I don't know if I'm doing the, verses, the words right, so I'm going to skip. Okay? That way I don't feel as ignorant. And I practice these words and practice these words and then when I come up here it goes blah 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 blah. So you're not the only one Merle. <laughs> Verse 16 And Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary and Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Verse 16 tells us the genealogy of Jesus is completed, that He is born, born to the Virgin Mary. It tells us who Jesus is, that He is the promised Messiah. There is no doubt. This is who Jesus is. He is the son of Abraham, the son of David, just as God promised. But more, He is the promised Messiah, the one that will save the world. Think about that. Matthew and his heritage had been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah. And it was finally here. He was getting to write about Jesus, the promised Messiah. Nearly 700 years had passed since David. And Matthew gets to see that fulfilled. I cannot imagine. And I sometimes think of that with envy. I think, wow, what would it have been like to walk in those days? And then I read further in Scripture, and Jesus says that He gave us His Spirit, doesn't He? People before Jesus' time didn't get to walk with the Spirit every day of their life, did, did they? 
God's Spirit came upon them from time to time. God's presence was there, but you have the Spirit of God living in you 24-7. And don't forget that, because we sometimes think of the Holy Spirit as the distant person of the Trinity that we don't understand when He's right here inside of us. Because God loves us so much that even when Jesus left this earth, He still left the Spirit behind. We're reading in our Bible study, and we'll read it today, that when we think back about these patriarchs in the Old Testament, we think, wow, what would have been like? And the author says, well, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to say, boy, let me wait to ask Moses what it was like to go up on that mountain and talk to God. And Moses' reply is going to be, you know, I had to climb that mountain to talk to God. When you wake up, God lives inside of you. Think about that. That's how blessed we are, how loved we are by God. And that's all possible because He's faithful and true and Jesus came to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus the Messiah was born. Christ comes to the world. In the Greek that means, the word is Christos, meaning Messiah, anointed one, the Christ. There is definitely something about a name. The song says it this way, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Luke tells of the coming of the Messiah also. Luke 2 verse 11 says, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. Jesus, the name above all names. It's why we celebrate Christmas. It's hard for me to comprehend that kind of love. I can't. It seems illogical that God would become flesh and blood, that He would give up His Son for me, for you, for everyone, no matter what they do, what they've done, what they possibly will do. That is a loving God that is beyond my comprehension. It seems illogical that God, the Creator, the Supreme Being of all the world, would enter into His creation to save us from our sins. Wow. He would sacrifice His only Son for me. The words that I have to describe that are unimaginable, illogical, and uncomprehensible. But it doesn't matter, it still happened. And I just have to accept it. I don't have to understand it because I can't fathom God's love. But God is faithful and loving and show, shows it so much through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what He did through the Son. It's unique to Christianity, like I said before. It's unique to the Bible and it's unique to Christmas. So when we are celebrating Christmas, remember to tell everyone of the joy that you have, that it is Jesus. He is the only reason for the season. We see so many other things infiltrate in because that's what Satan is. He's a deceiver. He wants to take the focus off of Jesus. I was listening to some programming on Moody the other day and it said that Satan loves for you to read your Bible. He absolutely loves it as long as you don't act upon it. And so many times that's what we do, isn't it? We read that away and we study so that we can learn all of God's Word, but we don't do what He tells us to do. We aren't the light of the world. So we can be as educated as we ever want to be, just like any physician that went and got all of the training they ever needed, but never used it once to save a life. Think about that. Satan is the ultimate deceiver, but God is the ultimate lover, isn't He? He's the ultimate one that's faithful. And He became a man so that we could become sons of God. Wow. And that all happened through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Emmanuel. Whether you spell it with an E or whether you spell it with an I. The NIV spells it with an I. Kim was asking me this morning. That's why I was looking at her. Names are of great importance. So what does that mean? Well... Adam was the first man, right? And his name means, or in Hebrew, it's Adama. And it means red soil or to be red, suggesting that we came from dirt. 
We only exist because God chose to create us. But we see something more amazing if we just start reading the first few verses of the Bible. We see that God chose to love us. Genesis 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man. And we've talked about that before. There's a relationship there. God is not a foreign God. He wants to be our Lord. He formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his, life, into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. God the Creator wanted to be our Lord. He wanted to be our Heavenly Father also. He wanted to have a relationship with us. We learned the name of the man in verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. We start to get personal. It wasn't just a man. It was a man that he named. It was a man that he gave responsibilities to. It was a man that was having a relationship with God. And then God said, everything was perfect. We saw that at the end of Genesis chapter 1. But on top of that, I'm going to bless you even more by creating woman. And he instituted the uh, act of marriage. Not the word I'm looking for, but he introduced marriage. And he did that again to show us loving relationships. So I emphasize that to you men and women. When you're mad with your spouse, remember that's one of the first things God did was He gave you your spouse to love so that you could see what godly love is like. The kind of love that He has for you. That He wants to pour His blessings upon you. That He wants to be known. Genesis is the book of beginnings. If we skip and we follow it all the way through, we see God's love for His people and the promise of a Messiah. If we skip to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, we read, She, being Mary, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And then it answers why right after this. Because He, Jesus, will save His people from their sins. Jesus tells us that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. Because God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Verse 22, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And he's talking about Isaiah here. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And it says it right here for us, which means God with us. Think of that. God became flesh and dwelled among us because He loved us so much. He kept all of His promises, even to a king like David who did the atrocious things we talked about last week, even to a people that denied His name and put up false gods all the time. God was still faithful and He loved. And He made that love poured out when He sent Jesus to be born in a manger. Jesus, Yeshua, or Joshua in Hebrew, means the Lord is salvation. The Greek translation is Jesus. However you pronounce it, whether it's English, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Chinese, Greek, Hebrew, Jesus means salvation. God brought salvation to us because He loves us that much. Matthew 121 says that Mary is to give her the son, the, her son the name of Jesus because He will save his people from their sins. Our Emmanuel, God with us. Why did God come from heaven to earth? Because He loved us. Why did Jesus die for us? Because He loved us. And in between His birth and His death, He teaches us how to be sons and daughters because that's what He came to do. He came to reconcile us and save us from our sins. So if He taught us in there, what more can we do but study those scriptures to be approved? To live a life. Not to be like Satan wants and us just to read our Bible and not act upon it. But for us to be the light of the world. When He left, He commissioned us. He gave us His Holy Spirit. He sent, us, he sent His disciples home for 40 days and said, don't go out. What were they doing that 40 days? They were contemplating this. Everything that Jesus had taught us, we can't do by our own power, our own might. But guess what? We've been equipped with everything we need through the Spirit of God to do what He has called us to do. 
Our life is not our own. Jesus bought it with a horrific price because God so loved us that He sent Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. John 1, verses 1 through 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Skipping down to verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Some people say that Jesus was just a man. This plainly says that Jesus was God. He was the one that spoke and stars were formed. Billions and billions of them. He was the one that spoke and complex life was designed. Not something that had to evolve. And it was perfect. That when we cut our finger, our blood clotted so we wouldn't die. Something that we would have never thought about probably if we designed life, would we? In all of our intelligence. Jesus was God and He came to earth so God could be with us. Our Emmanuel. Isaiah foretold it. Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne as promised and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And we have the word Lord put in there again, that God is our Lord. Zeal here, we take zeal to mean that it's fervent, excitedness or whatever, but here zeal actually means jealousy, jealous. God is jealous for who He is. God is everything. That's why when we study Revelations that we see that He alone is worthy in praise until we see what the Lamb has done. And then we see before the throne that the beasts and elders and all that are there are praising God the Father and God the Son because God was made flesh and dwelt among us. God with us, our Emmanuel. Jesus is the only way of salvation. And He will triumph, just as God's Word says. And He has made us brothers and sisters in Christ if we believe in Jesus. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call Him Emmanuel. 700 years after David, it didn't look like a Savior was coming. Not much to the people of that land. But God was faithful and true. Emmanuel in the Greek is a combination of two words from Hebrew. El, which means God, and Emmanu, which means with us. And that could have only happened through Jesus Christ. And verse 21 says, He will save His people from their sins. That's our Jesus. That's our Lord. That's why we celebrate Christmas. In the Great Commission, we're told to share the love that God the Father has. And that Jesus the Son had made... Uh, available to us. That we're to make disciples. We hear it over and over again. But maybe you've missed this part. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. Don't forget this promise though. And surely I am with you always. That's comforting, isn't it? To the very end of the age, Emmanuel, God with us. In the closing verses of the Bible, Revelation 21 verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be as their God. It's kind of like Genesis started out, isn't it? And we get that promise all over again. And we see that all of this is possible because God so loved us that He sent Jesus to die for our sins. Think about that this Christmas. Think about the love that God had when He sent His only Son, Jesus our Emmanuel. Make a conscious effort to tell people why you celebrate Christmas. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank You so much for the love that You have. It is 
illogical and incomprehensible to me that you could love that much, especially when we sin. But you don't hold it against us. You sent Jesus to die for our sins. And as long as we believe in Jesus Christ, truly believe and accept salvation that only comes from Him, we are born again by Your Spirit. We are adopted sons and daughters, and I thank You so much for that joy and that hope that You have instilled in all believers. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that does not know You, that this Christmas season, that even today, Lord, that they will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That they will not comprehend because it's incomprehensible, but they will get a glimpse of how much You love them. That You love them so much that You sent Your only Son to be with us. And I just thank You and praise You for Your faithfulness, for Your love, and for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.